Frank, I want to go back to the question I asked about. Um, uh, well, first of all, because it's quiet now, I wanted you to just tell us what you recall of uh, witnessing the lunar landing with President Nixon. Well, I, the lunar landing, I was with the White House, in the White House with him, and uh, it was an exciting time, I think, for every American, or every, probably every human being. Uh, and, and I think he was in, as caught up in it as anybody. I mean, he was, uh, he was very interested in it and excited about it. I think he really enjoyed them and was, uh, oh, what should I say, enthused with that phone call he made to them. I, I was, kept my mouth shut, of course, but I, I was, it was uh, interesting to watch him. It was almost boyish, boyish enthusiasm. Um, we've got a photograph of Dwight Chapin sitting with a cigar watching the landing, uh, which sort of says a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, tell us how you uh, how you began to, to know something about Vice President Agnew. Well, uh, uh, Pres Vice President Agnew was the head of the Space Council. He was the political head of the Space Council. The secretary of the Space Council, uh, the, the civil sermon head of it, was Bill Anders, who had flown with me on Apollo 8. And Bill kept telling me as we talked back and forth that we're, we're not going to get much out of the Space Council because the Vice President doesn't... Uh, doesn't take your great interest in it. And he said he spent a lot of times uh, playing pinochle on airplanes. And, and so I was, uh, I was, shall I say, motivated to think that the vice president wasn't worth much uh, because of my discussions with, with uh, Bill Anders. Um, did Bill Anders tell you about the debate over how many moon missions there will be? Uh, he, he alluded to that, yes. And uh, I think he felt that the uh, we were lucky to get him beyond 11, but I, I was not involved in that at all. But, uh, he, uh, he, he was involved in it, and, and he uh, didn't have a great deal of, uh, as I said, respect for Vice President Agnew. Now you mentioned his uh, thinking about Vice President Agnew in the context of the Apollo 13 challenge. Yes. Uh, I was, uh, again, uh, I, I, an Apollo 13 I was told by the head of the Manned Spacecraft Center, Bob Gilruth, that the vice president was, I believe it was Des Moines, Iowa, and he was going to come down to uh, uh, supervise the, uh, or, or at least to be there in, a, in a NASA Houston as they were trying to get Apollo 13 back. And uh, Gilruth told me, he said, look, that's the last thing we need down here is a politician and all the publicity and everything else. He doesn't know anything about it. Can you 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 worked at the White House. Can you get the president to call him off? We don't want him here. He's not going to help. Please. So I called Bob Haldeman, and Haldeman sent him somewhere else. <laughs> that was that was that for for the vice president. What what role did you play in keeping the White House informed from Houston about Apollo 13? Is that I unfolded? can't recall what I what, what I did, but I, I was I was. Uh, in contact with them a, a lot. I can't remember if it was with Haldeman or, or Flanagan, but uh, uh, it was not official. It was just. Um, I think it was Ehrlichman, actually. Ehrlich, maybe it was, okay. You, you sent, uh, I have the advantage. You know, sure. I, I well, no, I understand. That, I appreciate uh, you, it. You yeah. been I'm gonna, uh, listen, I'm being <laughs> interested to read these. Are these going to become public? I think, uh, uh, I think they all are public. Okay, uh, good. Um, but, uh, I mean, are your interviews going to be? Oh, the interviews public, sure, will okay. be public. Um, you actually made a nice point of of uh, getting the White House to recognize Ken Mattingly's work on yes. Apollo 13. Yeah, the fact that he was doing a lot on the ground to help get these guys back. Everybody on the ground did a remarkable job. Of course, I know. Jim Lovell, I'd flown with him twice. They did a remarkable job both. And listen, NASA in that era was a unique, wonderful organization. It really was. Um, There's one other one other interesting thing about about Vice President Agnew when, when uh, you know I, I would guess I was feeling my oats uh, when the vice when the president was going to run for his second term, I wrote him a letter, and uh, I said you know I hope obviously I'll be supporting you and I would hope for, but I hope you can find a new vice presidential candidate because I don't think the vice president Spiro Agnew is up to the chest. And he wrote me back a very nice letter, and that was the end of it. I never heard from him again. I never went to the White House again. I was, I was obviously consigned to the technical end of the business, leave politics to him. <laughs> uh, 
One thing that President, uh, one point you, you, you contact the White House about Julian Shear. Yes. The Vice President wanted to get rid of him. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that, but Julian Shear was a wonderful, wonderful PR guy. He really was. Uh, yes, take, take this. When we, on Apollo 8, we were circling the moon on Christmas Eve. And uh, we had a large, I was told as commander that we'd had the largest audience that ever listened to a human voice. And I uh, we're going to have a TV show. And I'm busy trying to get all the technical things involved. You know, what do I? And so the, uh, the uh, only advice that I got from NASA, Julian Cheer, was to do something appropriate. And I thought this was not only remarkable, I thought it was wonderful. Here's a free society not trying to impose a doctrine on the world with some business about the wonders of capitalism or this or that. And, uh, and that's how that Bible reading came about. So it was... I, I like Julian. Julian Scheer was a sharp, dedicated patriot. Uh, this is the reading from Genesis? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But after we were told to do something appropriate, uh, I, uh, as I said, I was so busy with the flight and the flight plan, but I called a friend of mine named Cy Borgen. I don't know if you know him or not, but you ought to interview him. He was, well, of course, he's very, very anti-Nixon, but nevertheless... Uh, I said, Cy, he'd, he'd worked for Newsweek, and he was a very cultured individual. What, what do you think? Give me some suggestions. He talked to a newspaper friend of his, and uh, they sat up all night, I guess, trying to figure out what would be appropriate. And finally, the newspaper man's wife, who, whose name escaped, shouldn't escape me, but came up with the idea, you really ought to read from the first ten verses of Genesis. That's how, that's how it happened. That nobody censored it. Nobody did anything. It was it was a remarkable experience from from my standpoint. Um, well, Ju Julian Shear uh, got into trouble because some people wanted him out because he was a Democrat. That's right. Well, so was so was Webb. They were Democrats. But you know, it doesn't really matter to me if if the person is really competent and he can make things happen and he's a uh, honest. What do you care whether he's Republican or Democrat? I found out that, that, that they do care. <laughs> um, uh, tell us a bit about your work um, with POWs. How did, you get, how did you get involved in that? I can't remember who in the White House asked me to get involved with that. But I know Ross Perot did uh, ask me to get involved with it. This was after I had uh, uh, I announced that I was going to leave NASA. And then uh, it was, I, don't, I think maybe President Nixon had uh, left by then, but uh, the administration sent me on a round-the-world trip. Uh, I, I visited, I think, 19 or 20 countries, basically just to draw attention to the plight of the prisoners. Uh, we tried to go into North Vietnam, but they wouldn't do that. Uh, they wouldn't, Red China wouldn't accept us. Uh, it was uh, it was thirty days of really. You, we, many places we didn't get very favorable uh, receptions. I remember the the man that ran swear head of Sweden there was a man named Palme, and uh, I, I would never buy anything Swedish now if he gave it to me. He was he was really virulent uh, against America. So was the uh, Madame Nehru, the uh, the head of a. Uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Gandhi, Gandhi. Indira Gandhi. Yeah, Gandhi. Uh, Kenneth Keating was the ambassador to uh, India, our ambassador to India. And after we got out of there, after she had chewed me out for half an hour, I went to the ambassador and I said, Phew. I said, how do you put up with that? He said, I don't have to. He said, you're the only reason I've even been able to see her for several months. So it was, uh, it was a, an interesting experience. You talk about people not liking the U.S. now that. Uh, we weren't very well liked around the world. Maybe we probably still aren't, but that was a, an enlightening experience for me. Uh, in 1970, the White House get, gets word that uh, you're going to be, or the group that's, the, the defense group for the POWs is going to try to get you a visa to Red China. Oh, really? I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, but you did mention to me that you thought you might get into North Vietnam that way. Well, that's what, that's what the, that's what the, uh, intent was, but of course we knew we'd never do it and never do it. Uh, 
Although, you know, Jane Fonda and everybody were flying in and out of there, but they weren't going to let anybody else in there. I'll um, I, I guess given what you said about the reaction uh, in 72, you, were you, inv you were not invited to the POW dinner that the White House had when they came back? No, I wasn't. No. No. I mean, it was, it was uh, like a door came down <laughs> when, the, when that happened. And I can't remember whether I made the trip around the world. I think it was for President uh, Ford, I believe it was, a after, after Mr. Nixon had resigned, President Nixon had resigned. Um, tell us a bit about the meeting that you and Jim Lovell had with Dwight Eisenhower. Yes, it was in, uh, I believe it was in, in uh, April of 69. He, President Eisenhower was in the Walter Reed in a hospital bed, obviously, in his last hours with all hooked up. You could see his EKG, and I don't know how he could stand to be like that, but he was very, very pleasant. And before, he'd requested that Lovell and I come by, and, and he wanted to talk about the space program. And so uh, we were told by the doctors, uh, you know, you can only stay in there five minutes. He's a very sick man, and that's it. So, well, yes, sir. We went in, and started talking to him and it was wonderful because the doctors came in in five minutes and all of a sudden he resorted to General Eisenhower. He said, get out, we're having a good time. And we, stayed, we stayed an hour or so with him and talked to him. It's kind of interesting because before I went into NASA, I had written him a letter. You know, at the, end, the waning days of his presidency, he had suggested that, that the, the space race may not be that important. It was just public opinion. And so I was a major in the Air Force. And I wrote him a letter and I said, uh, gee, you know, Mr. President, uh, uh, I'm surprised that you say this because I feel I'm a West Point graduate and I feel I'm defending my country as much as if I was in Vietnam and da da da. And he wrote me back a really lovely two page long letter about uh, what he meant and what he, how he didn't mean to disparage the people that were working in the space program. And I still have that one, so he's, uh, he's one of my heroes. What do you remember of that? Meeting. I mean, you were, must have been one of the last group to see him. You must have been one of the we, last. We, he died him. shortly after that. Yeah. Again, he was just a wonderful human person. Obviously, knew he was close to death, but uh, was sharp as attack. Sharp as attack. Um, did you meet John F. Kennedy by any chance? I never met President Kennedy. Matter of fact, I was at North American, uh, beginning to work on this Apollo program. Uh, when he was, uh, I remember I was flying in a, in a North American helicopter when we landed. They announced that the president had been, had been assassinated. So I never met him, at all. Um, there is a you you sent a note to the to the White House uh, contributing money to a uh, Dwight Chapin Defense Fund. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually a sort of ironic letter. Um, but did you? Uh, uh, do you remember where, where you were when, when you heard that President Nixon was resigning? I can't remember. But it was a real blow to me personally because, uh, you know, I, I had, my interaction with him, I, I thought he was in the best interest of the country. And then when I found out he lied, that, that uh, really was, a, that was a, to me, a very hurtful thing. I, 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 had, I had hoped he was trustworthy, you know, and that, it, was diff it was difficult. Uh, did you ever stay in touch with Dwight Chapin afterward? I didn't stay in touch with any of them, uh, even anybody in NASA, really. It, and I always believe you get one foot on the beach and one foot on the on the boat. You better decide whether you want to be on the boat or in the beach. And when that was over, I left. When the NASA program was over, I left. Uh, I wasn't. I was asked to uh, work in the administration of uh, Nixon administration. Uh, Haldeman asked me to uh, if I'd be interested. But I, and I said, well, yeah, what job do you have in mind? And uh, I, I never could get a firm answer. Well, it'd be a very important job. Uh, can, well, but what, doing what? Uh, well, you'd be at the policy level. I never really was told what would it be. So same way with Carter. Uh, Carter offered you a job? Yeah, that, I never will forget. We were, it was a, at the, you know, the alfalfa dinner in Washington, yes. I'd gone to that, and I got a call that the president wanted to see me. So I went over to the White House, and here's uh, 
President Carter with his, uh, what was the name of, the, of his uh, assistant that had cancer? Hamilton Jordan. Hamilton Jordan. They were there. And uh, I thought, uh, here, uh, I never will forget, Carter had brogans and uh, Levi's and a leather jacket on. And uh, this was a little different than the Nixon White House, you know, with suits. And, and they said they wanted me to come to work in the administration. And they, they have a little office behind the, uh, he took me in there and talked. I went, what do you want me to do, Mr. President? Well, we, 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 we're, you, you tell us, yes, you'll come, and then we'll tell you. Uh, well, under those circumstances, no. It was, uh, and frankly, I'm glad I didn't work there. <laughs> but it's interesting, you, you were considered a bipartisan kind of guy. I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, looking back at, uh, at Apollo, uh, for kids that are, are, are way too young to remember it at, or they just couldn't possibly have been alive at the time, put Apollo into perspective. What do we, you know, um, what did it show about us? What did it show about our capabilities? The Apollo program was, uh, I think, a brilliant stroke by President Kennedy. Actually, President Johnson had a great to do with it, too, because uh, President Johnson suggested it. Uh, President Kennedy gave the, you know, the, the political and, and the motivational reason for it, and the American people responded enormously. It was the closest thing, I believe, to the all-art effort we had in World War II that this country has achieved since World War II. It was about 400,000 Americans getting up every day trying to understand how they could do their job well so that we could beat the Russians to the moon. And uh, I was very fortunate to be a part of it. I, was, I felt very fortunate to be a part of it. The astronauts, like everything else uh, and every other form of endeavor, became the celebrities, but the people that did the work and, uh, and led it, Jim Webb uh, on down, I, I just have the highest regard for him. There's only one of them left, Chris Kraft. All the rest have died. About the astronauts, I remember uh, just thinking that when, when, when the White House was being encouraged to get rid of Julian Scheer, mm -hmm. um, the Vice President talked to some uh, astronauts, and you wrote, you wrote to them to say, well, one of the reasons why the astronauts doesn't like, don't like Julian Shear is that uh, the life contract has ended, uh, and he didn't want to keep Well, it we, going. nobody in NASA wanted that life contract. That was imposed by President Kennedy well, for the first seven. And when, when we got there, we participated in it, but I think it was something like $16,000 a year or something like that. And, of course, I like, I like that, frankly, because it was $16,000. I didn't have, we couldn't buy insurance. When, and uh, it was, uh, I thought, a worthwhile thing. And also, <laughs> they portrayed NASA, and the, you know, that was, one of the results of that contract was NASA could do no wrong. Everybody did everything right. So that was, uh, I don't know, I, I did not remember saying Julian Chair didn't like it. I hope in that letter said I liked Julian Chair because I did like Julian You Chair. did. You yeah. said he should stay, and you said it didn't matter if he was a Democrat or not. That's yeah, what you said. That's right. <laughs> Oh, good. Because he, exactly what you said here, he does the job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I just wanted, because it, uh, it uh, I, I. He's dead was, too. Yeah. But I, I, I noticed from your interaction with the White House that you, the Nixon White House, you didn't mind saying what you believed and I, what was on your mind. I hope that's, I always, when I ran Eastern, I always want people to tell you what they feel and what they believe, and then you, get all their input, make the decision, then everybody's got to salute and say yes, sir, and go do it. But until that time, what good is, an, is a staff person if he doesn't give the, the way he feels? Um, are there any other recollections of the Nixon period, Nixon White House, that you'd like to share with us that I haven't elicit, elicited? No, it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience for us because we were invited to many social functions there. And uh, I know for, uh, and, uh, and not just with the Nixons, we were invited to, to the White House in 68 to light the Christmas tree and for President Johnson. And it was, uh, you'd have to be awful crash not to think it was a great honor to, to be associated with people that, that run this country. I, you must have been in a ticker tape parade. We were in a lot of ticker tape parades after the, 
What, one in New York, probably. New York and what was that like? Chicago and well, that was one. They had a they had a big a big dinner at the Waldorf, and uh, Governor Rockefeller ga he gave us each some uh, some Steuben Mountains of the Moon. You know, well, that was heady stuff. Uh, I was a colonel in the Air Force, but uh, my main education in life. Well, I'll tell you, when I was a cadet at West Point in 1948, they took 12 or 14 of us over to Europe. The, the war ended in 45, as you remember. And we toured Europe, all through Europe, uh, uh, on a uh, mission to see what the, where the battlefields were. And, so, and we, we visited uh, Dachau and some of the, the concentration camps. And then we went to, to Spain, I mean not to Spain, to Greece, where there was still a war going on. That's the only time I've ever been shot at. But th that really focused my attention on the difference between this country and what freedom is worth and what the horrors that, uh, that I saw. People were still living, DPs, displaced people were still living in Dakar, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I, that's just sort of set me up, well, you know, this, is, this country is worth fighting for. And, I, and all I wanted to do was uh, be an Air Force officer. I taught people how to drop A-bombs, and, you know, it wouldn't bother me a bit. They tell me to drop an A-bomb on the defense of this country. All I want to know is where you want it dropped. It, uh, I really feel that what we have here is unique and special, and uh, I hope it's preserved for my great-grandkids. Um, well, Colonel Borman, thank you. Thank you. That's, a, that's an unsolicited... Uh, Appreciate it. But, uh, I feel like Gentlemen, thank you very much. Very good. Very good.